Okay, the first thing is that uh, this isn't a speech, it's a control. And it's a velocity control over uh, indigestion risk. Uh, because you need to put a bit of a gap between the first and the second courses, so hopefully it works. In relation to risk velocity, I guess it's something as a, a topic that's been banded around the industry for quite some time. And uh, we've been kind of looking at it, wondering what it's all about, doing a bit of research on it. And uh, internally, we started to do quite a lot of research probably about six months ago. Have a look, you know, Google it. Is that what research is all about? And there wasn't actually a lot there. There was a bit of definition here and there. And we thought a little bit more about it. And then some of our more receptive clients, we would throw it into a course and see what response there was. And uh, I guess over that six-month period, um, quite a lot of good responses came and said, look, there's something in this. As a result, when we thought about this technical lunch, we thought that perhaps the ideal topic was uh, risk velocity, and here it is. Now, in terms of thinking about risk velocity, I guess there's a couple of elements to it. One is the element of measuring the size of risk. If we think about why we bother measuring the size of risk, at its most basic level, it's a, a ranking, it's a prioritisation. It's trying to determine which, which risks require more of our investment and our time. Also, I guess it's good for reporting, which ones are going to get in the hot spots and the, uh, the light and the green, the amber and the reds. And thirdly, for those that you are particularly advanced financial institutions, also the impact on uh, risk quantification for capital purposes, although I'm not sure the degree to which APRA will factor in risk velocity in its capital models going forward, but I, perhaps that's a way that you can prod them a little bit if you think it's going to reduce your capital and keep quiet if you think it's going to increase it. So in terms of the traditional way of thinking about risk measurement, we've always traditionally thought about risk management in risk measurement, sorry, in terms of likelihood and impact. We've then ranked the likelihood, we've got the impact, and we then produce a nice five by five heat map or whatever you want to call it, and we put a dot in the appropriate spot where that risk comes. And that's the traditional way that we've always measured risk, and that's what most methodologies do. But what it does, in a way, it turns the complex topic of risk into a little black dot. The problem is, with that little black dot, it's a little bit more expansive than what a black dot would tell you. And what it really is, is that little black dot is really made up of what we as a firm refer to as the risk story. And each risk is made up of what, at least one or more causes, one or more events, and one or more impacts. And as the risk unfolds, it generally travels through causes, events, and finally impacts. Now, we refer to that as the risk funnel, just to demonstrate moving from one stage to the next. In terms, then, of the time it takes to evolve, we have really two elements of time. The first element of time is what is the time period between now and when the first or the risk uh, next occurs? And that effectively is the time between now and when the cause of the risk occurs. And it's this time here. Sorry. Let's go back one. That wouldn't work, would it, Elf? Hit the back key. There we go. We're off. And we call that lead time velocity. Why? Because there was no definition on the internet, so we've made it up ourselves. So in 10 years' time, when we refer to it as LTV, we'll all be famous and I can retire. <laughs> so we defined it as LTV, lead time velocity, which is the time between now and when the risk is next likely to occur. The second time um, period that we need to think about is when the cause now occurs. So the risk has started. What is the time it takes between the cause of the risk and to the impact to be felt? which is that time period there. Now that is obviously a slow risk relative to what I'm just about to show you. And it is travelling from its cause to its impact fairly slowly. Here's a fast one. We therefore have two elements. The time between now and when the risk is next going to occur. And secondly, the time between the cause and the impact. Now if we think about that, it's all about the speed at which the risk travels between now and when it first occurs. And secondly, a cause to an impact. And that we refer to as velocity. And if you take the Oxford Dictionary definition of velocity, the length of time taken by an object to move between two points in a given direction. And that's really what we're referring to in terms of velocity. So we've really defined it in two ways. Let's illustrate those two ways slightly, um, in slightly more practical detail. If we take three risks, the first risk is laptop hardware failure. 
let's refine it slightly to have laptop hardware failure in a brand new laptop. And secondly, laptop hardware failure in a four-year-old laptop. If you consider those three risks, the first one is quite general, not referring to the age of the laptop, and the others refer to it as a new or a four-year-old laptop. If we were to consider the time period between now and when that failure was likely to occur, that would, I suggest, be different for all three of those. And the issue is, how far in the future is the risk next likely to occur? Now, as I mentioned, we've coined the phrase here, lead time velocity, and we had to have an acronym, as I said, LTV. Meaning one is, therefore, the time to the next occurrence of the risk in terms of between now and when it's next likely to occur. Now, in many ways, that might not be new for most of us, but how we, have we handled it to this point? And if we think about how do we handle it, sometimes we see it in methodologies handled by the definition or the aspect of likelihood of the risk. Now, as you might be aware, the likelihood of a risk can be assessed in a number of ways. Firstly, the number of times it occurs within a set period. You might go 10 times per year. Secondly, you might assess it in terms of the chance of it occurring. Now, that is without time scale. Simply, what's the chance of it occurring? 30%, 40%, 50%. And then finally, you could do it as the percentage of chance of it occurring over a given future time period, such as a 20% chance of occurring over the next 12 months. Now, if you look at those, the first two do not take into account lead time velocity at all. The third one, however, does because it now assesses what is the likelihood of it occurring within, the, say, the next 12 months. If you have something you believe is very likely to occur in 18 months, but only a very small chance within one year, you would assess it as a low likelihood under the last one, and then at the end of the next year, the likelihood would go up, as you believe it will now occur within that six-month or 12-month time band. So if you do use the last scale down there, which I know uh, some of you do, you have, in fact, I believe, factored in an element of LTV into your likelihood scale. So in terms of then managing lead time velocity, number one, do you incorporate it into your likelihood scale, yes or no? If not, do you incorporate it as a separate measure? And most importantly, the longer the lead time, the more powerful are key risk indicators tracking the, uh, the um, increase in factors that look like the risk is just about to occur. The Queensland floods comes to mind there, thinking about all the factors we could have tracked up to the point that Brisbane was flooded, and perhaps fair to say that a lot of people did not jump on that soon enough and prepare themselves soon enough by having adequate leading indicators around those risks. So that's what it is in terms of lead time velocity. Now let's go to the second definition of velocity by illustrating two additional risks. The first risk I'm going to call radio jock risk, or Carl Sandilands risk is probably more relevant. And that is a uh, Carl Sandilands shouting his mouth off in terms of, in terms of uh, uh, detrimental <coughs> comments on your company. The second one is customer, beh customer behavioural change leading to a substantial decline in future sales. Now, if you think about those two risks, what are their major difference? Well, if we were to assess both of those risks using traditional likelihood and impact, we might end up with something that looks like the following. If we have this risk, radio jock risk, we might say the likelihood of it occurring using a scale in terms of likelihood of occurrence might be a two out of a five unlikely, but if it were to occur, the impact could be extreme. The second risk, we might also think very similar. Carl, oh, sorry, the customer behaviour changing, leading to sales decline, we might think the likelihood is a two, unlikely, and the impact is extreme because our business model could be in trouble. If we were to plot those risks using the current way we do in terms of likelihood and impact, we might get the following. Number one, customer behaviour risk, a two, five, and radio drop risk, a two, five. Therefore, on that matrix, they look the same. However, if you wake up at 4 o'clock tomorrow morning in a cold sweat, which of those two risks is more likely to be on your mind? Carl's mouth. And why? Because of velocity, the speed at which that can hit you. While you're asleep or sweating it out at 4 a.m., I'm not sure what Carl time he gets on, maybe 5, 
At one minute past five, he might be making derogatory comments. Two minutes past five, it's all over Twitter. Three minutes past five, it's all over Facebook. And four minutes past five, it's not worth going into work anymore. However, the customer behaviour risk is probably going to develop over a lot longer period of time. And therefore, what is totally different about these is the, um, the impact time velocity, which is the time between cause and impact. Now, some of you might be familiar with the description of risk based on a bow tie. We use it as a firm a lot, bow tie analysis, which takes the risk from its left, the cause, all the way through its events to its impact. In terms of a slow velocity risk, it might unfold like this. That would be really the customer behavioural change risk. If we think about a fast velocity or the Carl Sandilands risk, it probably develops at that speed. And that is the speed at which it passes from cause to impact. We've now introduced the second concept of velocity, which is the time between cause and impact. And we believe those are the two interpretations of risk velocity that we could have. The second one... To, it, to us, in many ways, is more important than the first because of the, um, the fact it's generally not factored into current risk measurement directly, as in the likelihood scale, but we believe it is an important element. Three types of risk you might wish to consider. Number one is the fast velocity, the radio jock. Medium velocity, such as system error, it might unfold within a day or two or three days. And then slow velocity, sorry, I didn't mean him to look depressed, I just wanted him to walk slow. Uh, something like customer behavioural risk. So if we then consider this as a valid concept, how do we measure it? Well, unfortunately, it adds another scale on. We now have likelihood, impact and velocity. Now, a lot of us um, use scales of 1 to 5. 1 is low, 5 is high, so I thought I'd keep the theme going. And therefore, we might have a measurement of risk velocity along the following lines. One, very low, up to high, five, very high. We've just done an example scale, very low, longer than 12 months between cause to impact all the way to very high. The cause to impact is within 24 hours. If we now decide that we are going to measure it separately, yes, it increases sophistication, but that might be the nature of risk and that might be what is required. So what we've now done is said we now add to, need to add on the inherent impact time velocity over here. You now have a third drop-down box including um, likelihood, consequence, and then the different scales. Yes, unfortunately, it also introduces the concept of inherent velocity and residual velocity, and the bit in the middle is the control velocity, which introduces, as I said, another third bit of work, and your risk control self-assessment workshops now increase in time, and everybody gets disengaged, and you go, what the hell are we here for? Well, this is the development of risk management, and this is exactly what we're here for, to hopefully prod your brain cells to think about this a bit more. Does it have a place in risk management as a separate concept? Now, the first one, sorry, was the customer behaviour risk, and as you can see, we've given it a very low velocity. We've now got the radio drop risk, has now got a very high velocity, and that's how we've now differentiated the two risks. Now, if we then compare the two risks, we've now got a differentiator. The likelihood and impact is the same, but now the velocity is different. Now, you intuitively thought the radio drop risk might keep you up at four. We've now got a measurement in a process and a system that effectively does that differentiation. Now, if we take the banking community over the GFC, good two examples of those risks might be fast velocity risk, liquidity risk, the left-hand one, maybe a slower velocity risk, regulatory risk. Now, if we look at the impact of that, Lehman's was liquidity risk, and in a very short space of time, 100 plus years of banking history, was gone. If we think about regulatory risk, maybe Goldman Sachs, pain but survived. Now, obviously, those uh, regulatory impacts were very big, but they had time to deal with them, had time to go and have a meeting with a regulator, have a coffee, go for lunch, go on holiday, come back, have another meeting, and we had a chance to do something about it, where liquidity risk, it was all over before we could even blink. And that really is the difference in, in, in uh, ultimate impact of those two velocities. Now, I'm sure this might be robbing uh, Rob's, robbing Rob's speech slightly. Social media. Emerging risk as social media. What does it do to risk velocity? It speeds it up dramatically. We do have some representatives from the Yellow Bank in front of us, and we often talk about the uh, time that the ATMs gave away free cash. 
and uh, the speed that that went round the uh, Twitter and queues of people queuing up at the ATMs bringing out cash. If that had happened 15 years ago, it would have been a blip, I presume. Because of social media, the velocity dramatically increased and therefore the resulting impact was a lot higher. Now in terms then of relationship between velocity and impact, I believe velocity has two effects on impact. Number one, the residual risk impact is often higher as there is less time to take corrective action. We simply don't have enough time to react. The second one is the inherent impact may be greater simply because of the higher velocity. I used to do a lot of hang gliding and one of my key controls was a parachute. And I would suggest that is a velocity reducing control and its major reason was both of those. Number one, it actually reduced the impact on the ground and secondly, it gave you time to think about where you were going to land or what, what might happen on the way down. So I believe that uh, control is both a velocity reducing risk and an impact reducing risk. We often call it a corrective control. and That's a good point. I'm not sure what we're going to call velocity reducing controls. We need another acronym point to note. Now if we think about controls, traditionally the controls that we have over um, operational risk or any risk we've got are number one, preventative controls. They are there to stop the risk occurring in the first place and they occur generally <coughs> towards the left of the bow tie which is towards the, co the cause. Prevention is better than cure. Those risks that do unfold, however, we now need to detect. So we have detective controls to identify that the risk is in motion so that we can go in and take corrective action. A smoke detector comes to mind. Thirdly, if it moves all the way through the bow tie, we then move to the concept of corrective controls, which is all about impact mitigation once the risk emanates. Now, if we think about the controls over risk velocity and what they do, number one, I believe less velocity uh, reducing control slows the risk down so that there is more time to take action. Number two, slows the risk down so that the actual impact itself is lower. Now I've used an example of hand gliding and uh, a parachute, but what about simply a risk that occurs that unfolds incredibly quickly in the public's eyes? The public panics. It gets a lot more media profile because the media love an immediate impact story. If you think about one that unfolds over a longer period of time, the public kind of get used to it. They get bored of it. The media gets bored of it. And in fact, just because of the velocity, it has a low impact in its own right. So we believe that is a, a very important element to a risk velocity control. So if they think about a risk velocity control, what might they look like? Well, the risk happens, then we slow it down with a risk velocity control. And its speed, moving from cause to impact, dramatically slows down. And as I said, we've got time to do additional uh, controls and also its, velocity, its impact in its own right might in fact be less. So as part of our research, we've tried to investigate velocity reducing controls. And it's not that easy. But that's one of the things that you have to do to have your lunch, is to kind of sit around your tables a little bit later thinking about perhaps what some of those high velocity risks might be in your business and what you see as perhaps some risk velocity reducing controls. Here's some ideas. Fire retardant doors. It might not stop the fire but it slows it down so we've got time to get out. Sprinklers do a similar thing. Sealed bulkheads in ships might just keep the ship up a bit longer so we can get people off. Bilge pumps might st stop the boat from sinking. I'm not sure why I had such a nautical but once the head was on that uh, path, that's where it went. Certain medical treatments are not there for curing, they are there for prolonging. Delaying payment in the banking system. Check clearance two days. Doesn't really take two days, but it gives us a chance to fix up any problems before the value has left the organisation. A river dam, slowing the speed of water. The UPS power supply might give us 30 minutes in which we can shut down all the servers properly and uh, go onto our batteries and close our PCs down and all those things. Speed cameras to slow your velocity. And lastly, cash flow forecasting. It's really slowing the velocity of liquidity risk, providing a greater buffer and minimising the likelihood of that risk occurring. There's just some ideas, but we're open to ideas and we'd love to collect any from that you can think of. Now, in terms of implications of controls, the higher the velocity, the more important are preventative controls because the horse has already bolted with a high velocity risk. Detective controls need to report rapidly and have rapid response action. If you leave it too long, it's too late. You've got to get in there very quick and act immediately. 
And finally, corrective controls need to be applied very, very quickly, otherwise the damage is done. The last aspect I want to address is the impact that velocity might have on your selection of key risk indicators. Now, as we might know, key risk indicators are there to identify a risk in motion. Now, a typical key risk indicator is a smoke detector. We call them detective controls. Why? Because a KRI is a detective control. A detective control is a KRI. So we're trying to identify the risk is in motion. Now, if it works well, this is what happens. It comes down, it turns, people come in and they catch the risk before it drops out the bottom. Now, if you've got a slow velocity risk, there's a chance to run in there with a net and catch, capture it. This is what happens if you have a high velocity risk. Too late, and they all end up there too. I love that one. It's great, isn't it? And it worked. So the impact we have on uh, KRIs is that the higher the velocity the or higher velocity risk, the more lagging the KRIs are, regardless of where you put them in that funnel. In terms of a slow velocity risk, KRIs therefore are more beneficial. So now what do we do about reporting risk velocity? We had fun and games here. So visualization, if anybody's got any ideas, we'd be glad to hear from you. Number one is to do colored dots on the two the five by five matrix. And you can see there we've color coded the risks according to their color to show the relative uh, velocity of each of those risks. That's one way perhaps we could do it. We thought about the three dimensional cube, but when we tried to do it, we couldn't understand head and tail of what it was trying to say, but maybe that'll be a work in progress. The other way is to think about measuring it by doing some kind of amalgamated score. Now, some people do an amalgamated score already for likelihood and impact by multiplying the two together, likelihood and impact. Now, you can see on the bottom there, so on the top, we've got the two risks. We've got likelihood and impact 2.5. Likelihood times impact is 10. If we were then to show them in a, on a, 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 multi, a, a scale of green, amber, red, it would show both of them as equal important risks. If we now add velocity on, we've now got a different velocity of 1 and 5. Now mathematically, I'm not open for argument here, because we just did this as an exercise thinking looked, it looked intuitively right. So we've done a score of likelihood times impact plus velocity. My mathematician here will take questions later as to the validity. <laughs> and we therefore have a score for the top one of 11 and the bottom one is 15. If we now plot them on here, we now have a differentiator between the two risks and we believe that's one way that we can show risk velocity fairly easily. So I said that there's no such thing as a free lunch. So it's now your turn. And we have got four questions of you. And you're going to have uh, 10 minutes to do this in your table groups, get chatting. And I want you to, number one, share some examples of what you see as slow and fast velocity risks in your business. I would suggest you focus on fast velocity risks. And you might want to just comment on some velocity reducing controls if you get a second. Then, question number two, do you currently use risk velocity as a separate concept in your organization? If so, how? Do you indirectly factor it into your current risk assessments? How do you do that? We'd love to hear. And finally, which is the ultimate question for all tables and they must answer a consensus view, do you believe risk velocity as a concept should be separately recognised and assessed in its own right or should it be factored into the current likelihood and impact scaling and each table has to vote and ALF will get the votes at the end of the session. Thank you. <laughs>